thank you, uh, all of you, for being here in Glasgow with us today at the University of Strathclyde, uh, connected <laughs> virtually to New York City and to the Columbia Climate School and a group of students there. Um, my name is Jason Bordoff. I'm the co-founding dean of the Columbia Climate School and the director of the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia SEPA. Uh, this is a special day for Columbia University. We come together to celebrate a really historic commitment that Columbia University has made to create a, a new school, the first in 30 years at Columbia, completely devoted to tackling the problem of climate change. And I really want to applaud the vision of my boss, President Lee Bollinger, uh, who you'll hear from in a moment, for undertaking an initiative at this scale within Columbia University. Universities, you all know, have lots of initiatives and institutes and centers. I ran one for many years before being asked to take on this uh, new role. But when you think about a school, the scale of a law school, a medical school, a business school, an engineering school, there's only a handful of those. And it is the largest commitment a university can make of its time and resources and people to an issue. So that's what Columbia's leadership has decided to do to marshal all the resources of a great institution like Columbia toward the challenge of climate change. To fulfill, of course, our educational mission to educate the next generation of leaders many of those here today uh, from all around the world, but including here students from the University of Strathclyde, to undertake the fundamental research core to what a university is all about, to develop the new knowledge that we need to make progress on climate change from science and engineering to finance and law and policy and social work and much more. And then to turn that research into action. And that's a little bit different as a major priority and area of focus uh, for some universities, but it's central to the mission of the climate school and how we've thought about integrating knowledge-based solutions, actionable solutions, so that our research is connected to the implementation and design of the kind of real-world solutions that we need really fast to the climate crisis. So in myriad ways, Columbia, I think, is breaking new ground through its very existence with a school like this, the first university school completely devoted to the challenge of climate change through a holistic approach to solve this unprecedented challenge, because climate is just immensely broad, as we all know, affecting every aspect of our lives, from geosciences to social justice, as we'll hear about in a minute, from engineering to economics, and I can go on and on. Uh, through partnerships, and that's a major area of focus and priority for us, because the staggering scale of this challenge can only be addressed in partnership with other academic organizations, with government, with civil society, with the private sector, and, and much more. And then finally, I'll note through an innovative model of shared leadership with co-founding deans. And I'm honored to be joined virtually uh, from New York today by one of those, my colleague, Sir Alex Halliday, who you'll hear from in a moment, who's joined in New York by the inaugural class of Columbia Climate School master students. Uh, you'll hear from them in just a moment and they'll come into our conversation. Uh, this commitment, of course, to tackling climate builds on an extraordinarily rich history of climate scholarship at Columbia dating back decades, particularly in the fundamental scientific research to help us understand this problem done by colleagues at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, the Earth Institute, Wally Broker, who first wrote in an academic article about global warming in the 70s, Jim Hansen's uh, work uh, on, on uh, in a few floors above the restaurant Seinfeld made famous and then his testimony in the late 80s. It's special to celebrate the climate school's creation here in Glasgow because the climate community is coming together this week to take stock, acknowledge how far we still need to go, how far we're honestly falling short today, and then ask what each of us can do in our own institutions to redouble our efforts in this decisive decade to turn the ambition that we are hearing this week and next week into action. And that's what we're doing at Columbia. We're stepping up and doing our part and we're going big to turn <coughs> research into action, to educate future leaders, and then to devote the full resources of an institution of the scale of Columbia University to tackling this extraordinary challenge. It's, um, it really is a historic commitment for Columbia. Uh, I'm really honored to have been asked to help lead this massive effort which we approach, as you all do, with the sense of urgency that the climate crisis demands. Uh, what can an institution like Columbia do? How do we accelerate progress on climate? How do we turn 
the ambition of this COP into action and to answer these questions and many others. We're joined by a really remarkable group of uh, panelists and we'll be joined by one more in a few moments. Everyone's running a little late with traffic around Glasgow and so Lawrence Tubian will be here in a little bit and then we'll hear closing remarks from Ali Zaidi, who's the Deputy White House National Climate Advisor. And with us today are really uh, good friends and climate champions who've worked in this space for a very long time. Uh, Catherine McKenna, who's the former Minister of Environment and Climate Change, former Minister of Infrastructure and Communities for Canada and a good friend, not just of mine, but of Columbia University. Mary Nichols, uh, who served for many, many years as the chair of the California Air Resources Board for uh, decades has been a leader in the climate uh, movement, one of the great environmental champions in the United States. And we're honored is a distinguished visiting fellow with us at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia Now. And Peggy Shepard, who's the co-founder and executive director of WE Act for Environmental Justice. Please give them a hand while I take a seat and we have a conversation. <laughs> So first, before we begin the conversation, um, let me quickly say that this event's being webcast live. The full video will be available on the Columbia Climate School website in the coming days. And before the conversation, uh, I want to turn to a few brief remarks from Columbia's President Lee Bollinger. I'd like to thank our hosts, the University of Strathclyde Student Union. I'd also like to acknowledge the four deans of the Climate School, Alex Halliday, Maureen Ramo, Jason Bordoff, and Ruth DeFries. Columbia has been at the forefront of academic discovery in climate science for decades. We have some of the best scientists in the world working all across the university, especially at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and through the Earth Institute. And everyone is trying to understand and address the causes, effects, and remedies that define the climate crisis. In recent years, we embarked on a systematic review to determine whether we were marshalling our academic resources in ways that were in line with the magnitude and gravity of the challenges. Those efforts led to the creation of the Columbia Climate School which we announced in the summer of 2020. It is the first new school established at this university in a quarter of a century, the first in the United States on climate, and a powerful and public confirmation of our values and our priorities. At the start of this academic year, the school welcomed the first cohort of students. The problems of climate are complex and interconnected. They run through so many of the great challenges facing global society, from poverty, poverty and food insecurity to health inequities. Solving them requires interdisciplinary work, new work, and collabor collaboration and the kind of leadership offered by the Columbia Climate School. The Climate School will be a widely networked hub for research, learning, and engagement. The school will feature large transdisciplinary initiatives that pursue groundbreaking scholarship and advance new knowledge. It will train future climate leaders from justice advocates and investors to scientists. It will strengthen Columbia's existing capacities in climate and develop new ones to translate research and education into actions that benefit society and it will communicate and engage with decision makers and communities on the vital issues of the moment to affect meaningful change. It is my belief that institutions of higher education should do more to address the major problems facing the world, something I call the fourth purpose of a university. The Climate School is one in a series of recent actions Columbia has taken to engage with the major challenges of the moment and it is a source of great pride for all of us. We all can't wait to see what happens next. Thanks, Lee, uh, for your leadership and uh, delighted to see uh, the inaugural class of uh, students 
uh, <clears throat> on the campus of the Columbia Climate School with, uh, with, with the founding dean, Alex Halliday, there. So, so let's, let's start a conversation here. And I guess I want to talk, obviously, about what's happening at the top and what the takeaways will be and where we're headed with climate action. But just start by talking, because we are at a university also here, University of Strathclyde, and you heard the vision that Lee articulated for what Columbia is going to do on climate by, in a sense, asking for your advice. <laughs> if you... You, you have worked in this space for a really long time. You have a sense of what's needed. We're falling short, right? <laughs> the, the gap between ambition and reality is growing, not shrinking. When we think about what it looks like to achieve net zero by 2050 or anything close to it. If you had a university at your disposal, Columbia, Strathclyde, or any other, uh, and you have something new that you can create, doesn't mean it doesn't have to look like every other school that's ever been created inside a university. Um, what would you do with it? What is it that we can do to be as helpful as possible through education, research, but also turning that knowledge into action to help the decision makers in roles like you have each and every day or had in policy and government or have now in civil society and social justice? Tell us what we can do to be as effective as possible. Can you start, Mary? <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, so I have the advantage of having heard uh, President Bollinger speak on this topic before. So. I heard him go a little bit further in articulating his vision for this school, and I want to quote him in a way and then sort of build on that. So what I heard him say was that he wanted to smash the traditional university and to move beyond the definitions that uh, apply everywhere in all great universities, and of course Columbia is one of the greats, that we do research, teaching, and um, service, public service. Um, and to do something that's more directly engaged. As, as he said just a minute ago, climate change being the obvious example. Okay, so he cited the example that he was looking for as uh, the medical school, because uh, all medical schools not only do research and teaching and, and perform service in the, in the community, they actually <coughs> run big hospitals and they are out there in the midst of crises. When, when there's a crisis, they're not... Um, sitting in their offices, publishing papers, telling people what they should be doing, although hopefully they are doing some of that, they are actually engaged and on the front lines. And I think what we need to do with the new opportunity that we have with the climate school is to um, train ourselves and um, challenge ourselves uh, to go out and be activists for climate. So that's what I'm hoping for from the, from the faculty and from the students. Peggy, you're an activist for climate. Yes. What would you advise? Uh, well, I also live within walking distance That's true, yeah. of the new campus, right, right. Uh, which is in Manhattanville in West Harlem. And, uh, you know, for the last 20 years, uh, I've worked with the Columbia School of Public Health, which will have a very important role in the new climate school. And I'm really looking um, for the school to be a strong anchor institution in a community that needs that kind of technical assistance, uh, that needs some of the information and data so that we can use that to create a more resilient community, neighborhood, and a more resilient city, of course. And of course, we're talking about a school that will have a global impact. Mm -hmm. And so I am really expecting, and I know there's been a lot of outreach uh, two organizations in the neighborhood um, to understand how we can begin to collaborate in a way that's meaningful and effective. Thanks. Yeah, we look forward to that. And that's a really important partnership locally. We're obviously thinking globally on a problem like climate, but we're working with you in our backyard. Catherine, we've talked a lot about the climate school in recent months, especially as you've thought about what comes next in your life after you're leaving politics. What do you think we should be doing? I you just need to be practical. Like there's no time. Like I'm actually, it's, it's funny because I'm at this cop and I'm partly like, you know, jumping for joy because people are talking about cross-disciplinary issues and climate justice and gender and indigenous issues. We probably want to jump out the window because we're not ambitious enough, but we're actually not practical enough. And I think I've taught at, at different schools um, and uh, having sat around in negotiations, I just think that there's a lack of understanding of the issues in depth and the intersectionality between issues. 
And so I think we need to have a much better understanding of climate and justice, climate and gender. So anyone who's interested, I'm watching Women Leading on Climate. It's about women and girls yeah, yeah. Uh, acting on climate, but also being disproportionately impacted. Now, I warn you, if you go to my Twitter feed and you engage, which you should, uh, I have some haters, but whatever. Um, but uh, I also think we need to engage students. Like, students get it. Like, I, I, I sometimes despair because it's so obvious that we have to be more ambitious and we need their voices, but we also, and I work a lot with young people, we need to give them the skills and the tools to actually help us <laughs> old people figure it out. And that's health. I don't think we understand, or, or I mean, people understand it, but we don't link health enough to climate, which is very important talking to people because people will care more. And Mary and I have worked a lot together. Um, and I know Peggy talks about this. I mean, they'll care more about air pollution because it's more direct to them. So we have to start thinking about that. I was with some banker types. They can't even do the modeling properly. They just can't really get it. So I think it's just across the board, working with indigenous peoples and heck, getting more diversity into this whole bloody thing. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful about us being in this school. And so I should say, I, I am, I guess I'm, am I announcing? Um, <laughs> I've decided, I, I've decided that to, uh, to come on board as, what am I called? A senior? Distin a distinguished visiting distinguished fellow. Distinguished visiting fellow. Don't tweet it yet. <laughs> we haven't really answered. But, but because I actually just believe that it has to be a global institution that is practical and links issues and, and empowers students and make sure we hear those voices and that the research is actually linked to what we need to do. You know, I care about getting off coal. It's actually like not, but you don't need like new game changing technology. We just need to do some flipping hard work. So these are the things um, I'm hoping uh, to work on uh, with students, with um, professors, but across, we had a great discussion with a woman the, the, who works in social work and uh, on gender issues, I think also cross cutting. Yeah, yeah, Courtney Cogburn, who's a, a colleague of mine and Alex's that, that Catherine and I met with recently, and we're honored to have, you know, leaders like you and Mary, who are a part of what we're building at Columbia, so thank you for that. Um, and and you, you mentioned uh, the importance of integrating issues of equity and justice into how we approach climate, which, uh, as, as uh, Alex sitting there in New York and, and the students know, has been a central concern and topic of uh, thinking as we build the curriculum, build the research agenda, and I'm kind of curious, maybe Peggy, I'll start with you. It's something obviously you think have thought for many years about, and, and the conversation has shifted and it was environmental justice as a topic for decades, uh, but, but how it's integrated into the conversation about climate change in particular, I think has changed in the US, uh, particularly with the approach the Biden administration is taking. How do you see it represented here in Glasgow? Um, it hasn't been represented well. <laughs> There's really no presence here. Um, for um, about environmental justice or environmental justice. Um, there are a few people in, in their dialogues that bring up the issue of equity and justice, but there's no real presence for that. And it's really surprising, especially given the impact on the global South. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, even certain states in, in the United States um, that are on the Gulf Coast experiencing extreme weather, whether it's California, where Mary Nichols is from with the wildfires or whether it's Alaska with indigenous folks having to already relocate mm -hmm. um, away from the waterfronts. Uh, the justice issue is so important. And we really understand that the climate crisis is really going to be transformational for the economy, for every aspect of our lives. And we've got to understand how those impacts will impact the most vulnerable, whether they're in rich countries like the United States or whether they are in developing countries that are experiencing drought and, and other key issues that are creating climate migrants, climate gentrification. <clears throat> so there are so many policies that we need to put in place to address all of the external issues that are happening uh, because of climate change. And that climate justice uh, perspective is so important because extreme weather is only going to exacerbate the underlying environmental degradation that is experienced by so many communities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just, I think you did not mention one of the aspects of this that I think about a lot. I think I'm the oldest one on this panel, so maybe it's more appropriate that I should, and that's intergenerational equity because 
uh, there's so much of a tendency, uh, it's human nature, I suppose, to postpone the tough stuff, mm -hmm. right? To always yes. put off the hardest, most expensive thing to last. It's almost like a principle in public policy and in politics. You do the easiest things that you can possibly manage and hope that somehow or another, you'll gather the momentum to do the hard things. That's what we can't do anymore. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, what the youth who are demonstrating around these issues are saying mm -hmm. to us. That's right. And, and we had the event the Columbia Climate School did yesterday well, on Finance Day was about how we're going to finance this transition, particularly in developing and emerging markets, parts mm -hmm. of the world that use almost no energy today, uh, therefore have not been historically responsible for nearly all the emissions that mm -hmm. have accumulated over time and need massive amounts of not just to deal with the impacts of climate change, but to facilitate growth in a cleaner energy trajectory than, than we advanced economies have done in the past. Um, and then thinking, of course, about a just transition. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about that here and uh, certainly in the United States, but depending on the geography, a just transition means very different things yeah. in different countries and, and regions. That what does it mean work. in Canada? Well, we actually, I mean, so, I mean, it's funny, I, we did a lot of work, so we're phasing out coal by 2030, and uh, I had to convince our finance minister that we actually had to invest in this because we're phasing out jobs. It's not like a transition in, you know, other industries, it's actually like a thing, and so it's really about these communities um, that, you know, they rely, the whole community is built around a particular industry, and so start with coal. It's where we started and we sent, we, we had a team, I had a great task force, they went there. Um, you can imagine how hard it was. You're in a room like this packed with people who are furious and worried, uh, scared about their future. How are they gonna pay for their you know, kids' education or to get food on the table? And, and what was their community gonna be? Because their community was completely around coal. But the thing that really got the folks that were there and it was labor and it was business was that actually people can believe that they actually came, we came and listened. And so do we, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done, even on that piece of just transition. I think there's many aspects of, of a just transition, but on the community transition alone and jobs, we cannot leave people behind. And I think when we, we make mistakes, if we sort of talk in a way that we ignore the people who have actually, we benefited from people who have been, you know, mining coal, who work in the oil and gas sector, that through there, I mean, that's how we turn our lights on. That's how we get our products. Those are really important jobs, but we have to transition. And I think we have to be very careful to not be, you know, kind of sound very elitist and say, well, I'm sorry, it's over. We're all just going to move on and too bad for you. Um, so that that's a piece, but it's, it's extremely hard. So if anyone wants to do research on that, <laughs> I'm happy to support research because there are, there are no easy solutions. And sometimes the jobs, how do you reimagine a community that has been built around one industry on, um, but that's critically important. But just transition, I mean, first of all, the language is terrible. So I think we may need to rebrand. I think branding <laughs> is extremely important in life. Um, we did pricing, we put a price on pollution. We started with carbon tax and we ended it making that it was like, it can no longer be free to pollute. If you actually test that and ask people, it would be way more popular. So free <laughs> advice to you folks. I mean, in California, thank God for California. But, um, so, uh, but I mean, look, just transition. If you talk about transitions, like I, I work very closely with Inuit in Canada. Can you imagine what it's like to be Inuit in Canada? Like now, basically, I'll tell you a story and it's sad. It's a sad story, but we have to tell sad stories. I'm like, now I'm going to just tell sad stories <laughs> when I meet with yes. finance people. So they actually dig a little deeper to figure out how they're going to get the money to flow. But so I'm on a boat and I meet um, Carter. Carter's from a place called Pond Inlet. It's in the high Arctic. And Carter said to me, like, he was a little shy, but we were, you know, it was a ship with scientists and all sorts of books. He saddled up beside me towards the end. And he said to me, you know, there's some impacts I think are caused by climate change in my community. I said, well, we'll I'll bring my scientists, go to scientists there. We sat down and he said, okay, number one, when I go hunting, my, sometimes my feet get stuck in, in thawing program plus. It's like quicksand. And so he said, well, that is an impact. Two, our caribou have disappeared, but so is all our country food. This is country food we rely on. Um, you know, it's not just food, it's actually their cultures, their tradition. And three, and this one really got me, he said, two of my friends have lost their fathers because they went hunting and fell through the ice that for millennia they've been able to tell the thickness of. And so what is the transition 
for Inuit. And why don't we care enough? Like, why can't we just act faster? Because we're all feeling the impacts now, but we know 1.5 degrees, many people, countries will be underwater and we're gonna have climate refugees. So we are like, we're not immune to this. And it's the same, you know, with our, the high Arctic, when you are the Arctic, um, when you look at the impact. So I think the transition, it's a very broad societal transition that we do not, we do not understand properly. And we have to become way more sophisticated with the tools, but the actual real supports to people, like it's actually money. It's actually like understanding cultures. It's actually engaging people in decision-making in the process, which we've tried to do a COP. We have um, an indigenous people's platform that we push for. We have a gender action plan, but because people don't understand the issues in a sophisticated way, and often the folks that we're talking about are on the outside, not at the table, um, it's very hard to find real solutions. Thanks. And we're honored to be joined by Laurence Tubiano. Yay. Thank you for being with us. We Yay. told everyone at the outset traffic is terrible in Glasgow trying to get around. So thank you for, for joining us. And everyone knows Laurence, CEO of the European Climate Foundation, former climate change ambassador for France and critical part of the Paris Climate Agreement and, and those uh, at that, that COP. So you're just in time because we've been talking a little bit about the role of universities and educational institutions in tackling the climate crisis. I did want to use this opportunity with four leaders like you here to get some reflections on what's happened the last few days and what's going to happen over the next week and a half. And I uh, would love your, your take on that, but I'll give you a moment to catch your breath first. So <laughs> Um, we've had a lot of announcements this week, uh, government announcements on methane and deforestation, coal financing. We've had private sector commitments uh, and private finance uh, commitments. Um, the world leaders have mostly gone now. Negotiators are doing their work. So I'm just kind of curious for people's take on, as we, when we look back, uh, what will be most consequential uh, about what came out of this COP or won't be? I and mean, will we look back and feel like... Uh, we did not do what we needed to do. Well, I think Laurence probably has some things. So I, saw, <laughs> yeah. I, saw, I saw her tweets. You should all go follow Laurence's tweets. Yeah. Um, well, of course, there are some good news. We, uh, I was with Fatih Birol this afternoon saying, now we have all the pledges. It points to 1.5 degrees, such as the great. And, uh, and we have an announcement of Poland that finally they would backtrack the announcements they made today. <laughs> so this is all about the story. If I think it's it's very good to see that the pressure, the peer pressure is functioning. You know, whether Paris mechanism or Rachelin is functioning, what with a condition that we have the capacity to really raise this pressure to a point, and it could be through the Paris Agreement mechanics, but mostly by other elements, which are not in the Paris well, referring to the trade elements, referring to the financial elements, but are some are, of course, in a way framed in the Paris, but of course not dependent on the agreement between government. And that this can, of course, allow what we need, which is the credibility of these commitments. And you know, for me, Glasgow is about exactly that. The credibility as a accountability across the board of, of course, government, so it's fantastic that Vietnam has committed to no new coal power plants. One month ago, they have a full pipeline. I don't think they have changed the modeling for their 2050 in one month, but I, the result is a peer pressure, mm -hmm. which is good. And so we know Paris Agreement function on that. No more, we don't have sanctions, but so, I think it's a moment of truth that I think the civil society, the judiciary in, in countries where it functions, the accountability of everyone, particularly the investor sector, Catherine knows well. So no pretend you do, but do. And that way we may have to think about a new layer of governance above what we have already, which is my observation, how we build the accountability for everyone from the MDBs who are not delivering really, Mm -hmm. to the private investors that have committed to a lot. But for the moment, when you look at the financial alliance that was <coughs> announced, uh, in Gla the Glasgow Financial Alliance announced in 22 of April in US, very, very impressive mobilization of trillion. But for the moment, 0.5% is going to green, green transition. So I think it's good we have finally what does the Glasgow say, we can do it. Mm -hmm. 
But now let's do it. Yeah. And we may yeah. not have all the instruments. Uh, we need the regulators to be much more forceful. Mm -hmm. I think about the central banks in particular, the accounting system in every country. We need benchmarks. That, so that's my obsession. How we get now the last mile of accountability in, in a system where, of course, government has taken an engagement, but that will not be enough. We need the accountability across the board. And it's good because the climate regime is a very systemic issue. You, it's not government, it's all the economic activities from agriculture to industry, from transport to land, land management. So I think we, we need this instrument and we, for the moment, I don't think we are there, but it could be a fascinating exercise, including for university to mm -hmm. see the new system of governance we are, we should look for. You, you use the, well, I'm gonna get reactions, but just a follow up, you, you use the word <laughs> accountability. Um, and, um, and new governance. And I'm just uh, implicit in that is the idea that voluntary national action is not sufficient. And that what you're describing is a system that has more accountability, has penalties, has enforcement. And is, is that what you're suggesting well, as the Europeans <clears throat> try to put in place a carbon border adjustment? Mm -hmm. Does that go in that direction? Is that what you have in mind? I, I think so. I One, uh, within an international agreement where everybody has to sign on, we would not, of course, include sanction. That doesn't work in international law. But we could have, you know, the periphery, the, the element of implementation getting more teeth. So that's one. So that's why the sign uh, of the carbon border adjustment was like a, a stone in a pond. Huh? I don't know how much it will be widely, in a way, implemented <coughs> and on all sectors. But even when I was discussing with Gina McCarthy, Yesterday, the fact that the EU and US could discuss on the steel, withdrawing the steel tariff on the base of carbon intensity. Very good, for example, example. But I was thinking as much, maybe as much, on all the system doesn't have even the two years time where they have to present what they have done in the, in the, in the framework of the Paris Agreement, which, who are not governments, who are non-parties to the Paris Agreement. There we are only voluntary, and we don't have any accountability mechanism. They can be created, mm -hmm. absolutely, nationally, which anyway, Paris Agreement is as good as there is a national law to implement it, <laughs> which is the base of the system. But I think on, on private companies, on investors, I think it, it's good for everyone to be truthful, everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so the discussion we have seen between protesters, and, and investors on, on offsets is a good sign. We, we, we need clarity, we need benchmark, we need serious net, and then everybody can build trust. Mm -hmm. And if you build trust, you build the right market mm -hmm. signals, and you build finally the, the, the expectation that finally Paris Agreement is based on that if everybody believes that the transition is underway, everybody would like to bend back on it and not try to oppose it at all costs. We're going to bring New York into the conversation yes. soon, but let me get some reactions to that. Well, uh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, the France is amazing, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> actually, you made an interesting point that had because sometimes we move that down. So I think that the point that you made about the Paris Agreement being resilient and that you know you have a framework um, without sanctions because you can't do that international under international law, but but peer pressure works. Um, and that's why people are like, well, why go to COP? Because I thought about that. And it actually is, it is good because then the whole world yeah. is looking at folks and they have to do more. I, I think though it is interesting on these other areas, like so on finance, so we have this announcement of 130 trillion and I am very, you know, it's very it's good. skeptical. I mean, it's very good, but it's, what is like, what is- It's real money. It's real, it's <laughs> definitely a lot of zeros, but I mean, how much of that is gonna go? Because it's only zero point, what did you say? So there of course. A lot of zeros when it's no, five, yeah. <laughs> zero point five. Okay, but I think that Mark Carney has also so he's very Canadian um, done work <laughs> on um, uh, he's done work on disclosure and we're seeing a lot of progress on that and so I think that these other pieces where you say that there needs to be more diligence I think border carbon adjustments I mean I like sometimes wonder with the U S and like we don't have a price on pollution so we have to be a bit careful about trade barriers but I think that you know those pieces will. They all have an impact as long as people are sort of thinking about how these systems work together because it is very important. Competitiveness is a thing, but I, I think, yeah, I mean, I guess, okay, now I'm a little more optimistic. Thank <laughs> you, <laughs> I feel a little bit better tonight. Um, 
But I, I think that it is, I, I think it is important. And the hard work that people wonder what's going on at COP here, because you, you mentioned that maybe we should talk about that. I mean, there are negotiators negotiating and there are things close to my heart, like Article 6, the markets. Um, but that's not really what ministers and leaders are doing. Right now, this is a different COP. It's like implement. How are you implementing? And there's a lot more work, as we know, to be done in that piece. Yeah. So let's start with the credibility issue or accountability, which is the data. Uh, what is more close to the heart of a university than data, right? <laughs> yeah. and that's what they live and die on. And how do we acquire it? And how do we agree on which data we're going to use and what's going to make it reliable? And then figure out how we incorporate it into our, into our systems. Uh, it's going to take argument. It's going to take um, invention to some degree because, you know, I worked on clean air for many years. We built a monitoring system that's the envy of the world to tell you what the air quality is like. It still doesn't tell us, you know, down to the community level or the individual exposure level what we need to know. And we spent 50 years doing it and hundreds of millions of dollars. We can't do that. We can't replicate that. We have got to move faster and um, in a much more democratic way. Um, to uh, incorporate data into the decisions that are that are being made. And I think that's just one example of what it's gonna take to implement what they're now talking about here. Well, some of the people who are studying how to put that data into practice uh, and use it to do what you just said are sitting in the new Manhattanville campus of Columbia University in New York with my colleague, Alex Halliday. Uh, so I wanna turn it to Alex now, who's gonna take questions from a few students for our panelists here in Glasgow at the COP. You should come too. Everyone's mm -hmm. Are you come? Do you come? Are you the sound. Are you yeah. Is the sound working? It is, yes. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Well, firstly, um, thanks very much indeed, everybody. Really great to be here today. Uh, it's brilliant to be connecting with you on this global problem in this global way. Uh, and uh, wonderful to see what's going on in COP, and I'm looking forward to getting over there this weekend. I'd really like to thank Jason Bordoff for pulling this event together. Uh, and at the same time, it's great to have some students here in the audience. And we're going to hear a couple of uh, questions from them in a minute. Uh, I thought uh, what Catherine, uh, Mary, Peggy, and Laurel said was just fantastic. I just had a, an hour and a half with the students this morning, a group of students. And so many things that you said resonate uh, because they actually are things that students are really wanting to hear about and wanting to learn about and wanting to be engaged with. So the uh, big, if you like, the three big questions that a university might try and address as a climate school. Now, firstly, what is the future of the planet going to look like? Uh, you know, to get back to that whole issue of uh, climate change, how is the climate going to change? We've been caught off guard because the climate actually is changing in ways we weren't prepared for. And in some ways, we need to get better at that going forward. And you need the brightest and best intellects to get to work on that, to improve the models using artificial intelligence or whatever, to actually really fine tune what the world is going to be like. And then the second big question, I guess, is what does the world need to be like? So if you are trying to think about 10, 20, 30, 40 years, 100 years in advance, what kind of structures do we need to have in place to actually uh, get the Universe, the whole, um, sorry, the, um, the world on a more sustainable basis going forward. And that could be things to do with, um, that could be things to do with how do we decarbonize the atmosphere? How do we actually get carbon out of it? Where are these structures going to be located? Uh, what's the global governance for these things going to be like? How are we going to get rid of the CO2 and bury it? Who's going to be in charge of that? Will it have any effect on biodiversity, which is another great challenge we face? So there are these huge interconnected problems about what the future of the planet needs to look like. And then, of course, the third big question is, how do we get there? And I think this is something where we need to really engage with so many people from society, uh, whether it's businesses or whether it's actually governments, but also with communities. And it was great to hear so much being said uh, just now by our speakers um, uh, on this particular issue. This is a massively important problem. 
It's an issue of uh, partnerships. It's an issue of <coughs> trying to achieve a just transition. And it's really an important issue from the point of view of trying to engage in particular with the issue of uh, co-creation of knowledge, where we work together. So that's a key part of what the Climate School is going to be about. Uh, we're not just going to be about um, trying to give our lectures and talk to people and get them to learn. The idea is to actually bring in people who actually are part of the solution by not being part of the Columbia University circle in the normal sense, but actually being people who are confronted with the issues of climate change on a day-to-day -day basis. And our conferences that we run on Managed Retreat are a good example of that, where we bring people from around the world to talk about what it's like to actually deal with climate change. So these are all the great reasons why we need a climate school, and I think we've got a great opportunity going forward. Um, but we really want to work with the world on this in partnership, and we really appreciate having voices like those we just heard to be involved in this. Um, and of course, a key part of this is training new leaders and creating new opportunities for uh, people going forward. And in that respect, what I wanted to do was to, in particular, highlight the role of students and young people. It's, like you say, the biggest intergenerational human rights issue we face, and we have to be um, fired up in terms of thinking about the future of the planet from the point of view of the people who will actually be most affected and who haven't actually really contributed themselves to the problem. And that's both a geographical issue, it's, a, it's uh, to do with standard <coughs> of living, and it's also to do with an unfairness and, and the legacy of history, but it's also to do with young people in particular. So with that, I'd like to actually introduce a couple of young people who are going to ask some questions uh, from the audience who uh, have uh, come prepared to uh, put these questions. Not sure how much time we've got, so I thought we'd actually maybe focus on just having the two questions together and then allow the audit, the, allow our panelists to actually answer those questions uh, in one go. So first of all, we've got Susanna Iban hicks who's going to ask a question. Hi, thank you so much for your perspective. Um, my name is Susie, and I'm a climate educator. And my question is, how do you rationalize inviting top polluters to the table during COP26? And what role do you think greenwashing is playing in the negotiations? Thank you. And the second question is from... <laughs> The second question is from Adrian Bolger. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Adrien Bolger, and oh, I wanted sorry. to ask you... No, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, the, um, the, the role that the new climate school could play to make the difference, but you already answered the question. So my question would be uh, that I'm fighting, fighting hard, actually, to reconcile the fact that uh, US President Joe Biden pledged for more climate action. And at the same time, two days before the COP started, he asked for the petrol, petroleum states to produce more, more oil. So how, how could we actually reconcile this objective between ambition and action? Thank you. Uh, greenwashing and the world we have today and the world we want in the future. Who wants to I'll take start, that first? If time? I may, because um, I, I think it's uh, totally appropriate that we set goals that are beyond what anybody is doing today, even though it makes us look bad and feel bad because we haven't achieved them, right? When we would like to have achieved them already. But the second piece of that is to make sure that in the transition process, we're not settling for incremental steps anymore. That is really, I think, the number one uh, concern that I see. I feel it about my own work and the, uh, the work we've done in California. You know, we proceeded beginning back in, um, you know, in 2006 to head towards the goal then, which was the Kyoto Treaty, which was just taking us back to 1990 levels by 2020. And we achieved that goal. So then we moved towards, towards a more ambitious goal. But it wasn't until just a year or so ago that California and now many other places for sure um, said, we're going to ban the internal combustion engine and we're setting a deadline and we're telling industry no more. And the diff, I mean, it's a shocking thing. It's really not something, you know, generally that politicians feel comfortable uh, doing. 
uh, and it was done by an executive order, uh, but it still has to be implemented. But it did send the message, and I don't think it was only us or only you know the United States. It's others also demanding that there be more zero emission vehicles, and suddenly every single car company is making not just one, but many, and they face a future where they know they won't be making that anymore. That's actually a good example, but it's only one out of many, many more that we need to see happen throughout the economy. Catherine, yeah. speak to both questions, but but you know, in particular, the second one, I mean, I'm thinking of Canada because the oil industry is important to the economy of Canada. Is that something you struggled with as a policymaker? How do you think about the, the reality today and how do you think about the need to dramatically reduce oil use going forward? I'm curious your thoughts. Well, so I totally get it, right? Like, you know, if I was young, I'd be exactly the same, same thing. Um, so in Canada, you know, I started off and I didn't really know much about climate. I came to Paris two days and I was a minister. And uh, so I had a steep learning curve to just understand this whole issue. And of course, in Canada, it was extremely challenging um, because we produce, uh, we produce a lot of oil and gas. Um, and so there is no great answer in the way that will satisfy students. And I think that's kind of good because you shouldn't be and young people should not be satisfied. <laughs> Let me tell you how many times I didn't want to sit at a table with certain folks. Like, I was like, I can't even believe I have to be in this room. But the reality is, imagine you go to like a meeting with a big, like, and you're talking about pollution and you have the people who are the biggest polluters mm -hmm. and they're not there. And they're like, amazing. They're like, this is great. We're just going to keep on polluting. And your answer could be, well, just regulate them out. But Big polluters, you may just focus on oil and gas. And by the way, I have to give the prime minister credit. He made a very big announcement this week that there are reverberations and very big implications in our country, including in Alberta uh, and Saskatchewan by premiers, where he said um, there's going to be a cap on emissions um, from the oil and gas sector and the emissions are going to have to go down. So that's actually an impact of production, right? Like that's actually a real thing to these yeah. folks. Um, but I mean, look, I think some of them are really bad and some of them are part of the solution, but we have seen that actually pressure makes a difference. But remember, we're not just talking about oil and gas. We're, what are the heavy polluters? Because I spent a lot of time in Canada, I just look at these charts, graphs, like that's what that is. Like you just look, who can we get? How can we get our emissions down? Uh, it's aluminum, it's steel, it's cement. And we need to get emissions down, but we do still need these products, right? There's not like the transition isn't literally going to happen overnight as much as we might want it to happen. And so you have to figure out how to tackle those sectors. That doesn't mean you sit in these rooms and you can imagine me because I'm no shrinking violet. I don't sit in these rooms and say, what would you like? Because I'd really like to do what you like. No, I'm like, okay, climate change is real. We all got to be part of the solution. Tell me, you know, how are we going to do this? And then Sometimes I walk out and say, they're not going to do it. So we're just going to have to just figure it out. We're going to have to regulate. But I, I get it. I just worry that, that actually these people kind of don't want to be in the room, some of them. And it's actually way better when they're really uncomfortable and they have to be part of the, the conversations. But yes, many times you're going to have to regulate and do some really hard things. But Laurence, I'd be quite interested in Laurence's views <laughs> about this. <clears throat> First, to, to say that for me at that particular moment, I would not have said that even two or three years ago, that greenwashing is really, I, I say, it's a new climate denialism. Because no. now it's very difficult to be a climate denier. But you know, now there's another door you can enter in uh, by and you say, finally, I'm doing it. Just don't be, be quiet. It's okay. We are doing it. But of course, it's not. And, and this is a problem because a part of the economy is doing it. Huh? There are some companies who have done really a good job. Um, investors have done a really good job. They are the front runners, they are the minorities, that's for sure. Uh, but you are now great companies that are doing 100% renewable energy. And they were coal based, uh, gas based <coughs> companies maybe five, 10 years ago. So, so the problem is that washing is in a way not rewarding the ones who are really doing the, walking the walk. And I totally agree with Mary, this incremental mindset is, of course, you know, you're in a government, Catherine knows even much better than that. When you are in the government, who you do see every day, 
the vested interests that of course you have problems and you have to deal with their problems and that's your political space. And then you have to expand the political space to say, I can do, I can go from incremental to transformational. And then you need a constituency to support that. It's not easy, huh? well, you, you know all this, of course. So I do think that's why at that particular stage where we are, where now everybody wants to embark on Paris Agreement goals on the lining with Paris, which is now the catchphrase, we have to be serious about what does it mean. That's why I think it's good, even if it's not agreeable, to say, look, let's, let's see what it means. Let's show your cards. <laughs> Uh, again, the, that's a step two of TCFD, yeah? uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it has to be in a way where the regulators have to just now work really seriously uh, to say, look, the, the plans are not there, or it's not because you have a target that you would get that. And I think this peer pressure would, would improve mm -hmm. the, the solutions, <laughs> and, and particularly because the market will play with. So I, I would think, and then of course, the contradiction you are referring to, they are always <coughs> there because that's why we need a, a broader political consequences, citizen calling for action to allow government to go the next step. Because if not, if you are looking on the Alberta, mm -hmm. what, what do you do? You can't, but if you think more broadly. But we have only one person on this panel who industry is actually scared of, and that's you. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, because now all we hear is we can't build anything, we can't do anything because of these community groups, the EJ groups that are going to keep us from getting our permits. So. Well, you know, <laughs> we've got to have a diversity of perspectives. We've got to understand, uh, we've got to all be in the same room together. We've got to have the people who are causing the problem, and we have to have the people who are on the receiving end. And we've got to begin that dialogue. And you're absolutely right. Um, a number of uh, industry people are reaching out to the environmental justice community for a dialogue. Um, what is environmental justice really? What is cumulative impact? What do we need to be doing? Mm -hmm. um, and by the same token, uh, what is your business model? Um, what are the issues that we need to take into account uh, when we're beginning to develop solutions? Mm -hmm. And how do we hold you accountable? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that cannot happen without a dialogue <laughs> and without uh, a real understanding of the business issues that are going to have to be regulated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah. so, again, um, I think a dialogue is important. That greenwashing, inviting people to uh, pretend that they are something they're not is a whole other issue. But we certainly need to be in dialogue together. And that's the way we begin to also hold people accountable. So I'm going to ask in a minute, not yet, for you to thank <laughs> our panelists, because the hardest part for a panel like this with such a rich conversation is synthesizing it. So I outsource that. So for uh, <laughs> concluding remarks, we have many former government officials here and community activist leaders, uh, but a current government official. And uh, Ali Zaidi is the Deputy White House National Climate Advisor. Uh, Gina McCarthy was going to join us and unfortunately was unable to be here. And I appreciate Ali being willing to come and share a perspective on behalf of the administration uh, and as someone who knows what we're doing at Columbia, who knows a lot of people on this panel for a long time, Ali, if I can invite you to come to the lectern and offer some concluding remarks, and then I'll ask all of you to thank our speakers and panelists and enjoy some cocktails. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, well, let me just start by saying what a group Jason pulled together of women leaders that that all of us should look up to in the climate movement. I'm looking at young women on the other side uh, in New York, and hopefully um, we bring in uh, the most diverse, most uh, robust set of leaders we can to, to take on this challenge. Um, earlier this year, uh, Laurence and I were on a call with, with the EU. Uh, talking about how we could exchange ideas and move ourselves forward together. Peggy has been a source of wisdom uh, to the Biden administration before that, to the Biden campaign, telling us what we got right. And as you can see, also telling us what we got wrong. <laughs> uh, Catherine has been a partner as has the country of Canada, our first bilateral conversation that the president had uh, when he took office. Um, 
and by the way, a conversation that included from day one, the topic of climate change. Um, and, and Mary's broad shoulders, I think all of us uh, in climate policy in the United States continue to build on uh, her pathbreaking work on vehicles in particular, uh, we continue to benefit from as we make the shift uh, to electric, not only in the United States, but all around the world. So uh, a round of applause to, for Jason and the team for pulling together such wise, wise people. Uh, when I was born uh, that year, the, uh, the observatory at Mauna Loa um, started to touch 350 parts per million. Uh, and for the scientists in the room, that's my coded way of saying, I'm not that old. <laughs> uh, but it, you know, in the decades since, we've seen that climb from 350 to 375 to 400, uh, breaching a new level that we've never seen before on planet Earth. And you don't have to climb a mountain in Hawaii to figure out that the climate is changing. We see it in all of our communities, whether it's in the low-lying areas where the floods sweep in now with greater ease and greater destruction, or our wildfires that now surge closer and closer to population centers. In the United States, fires burning on our West Coast actually impacting air quality on our East Coast. And droughts that parch uh, our communities have changed the way of life for so many. I, I liked what Catherine said about telling the sad stories. And something I heard from uh, a youth activist uh, from Kenya the other day, allowing ourselves to feel that, to feel the pain. Uh, and allowing us to be motivated by that. Now, growing up, starting from that 350 ppm, um, you know, we were told to change our behavior, look at things like recycling and reuse uh, as the tools um, to improve our environment. I remember being in college, this was my first act of environmental activism and calling on our campus to be greener. And we had really, really bold ideas like double-sided printing <laughs> and recycled toilet paper. And even, this was our reach ask, the two-way flush. Um, today, kids, and, and I don't make fun of recycling. It is an absolutely critical component to all of this. But today, kids at my alma mater are calling for divestment and they've been successful. And kids around the world, in front of the White House, everywhere, have been marching, they've been striking, they've been staying hungry. They're calling for systemic change because they get it. Their eyes have been opened. They realize that the way we solve this problem is not by tinkering at the edges, but by reweaving the fabric of our economy. And here's why that's so important, that task. Because when you go at reweaving the fabric of the economy, you actually come up against some of the tears, some of the scars that popped up over hundreds of years. And you've got to deal with those things. You've got to deal with every sector. Look at agriculture, look at power sector, look at industry. In every one of those, there's challenges, but there's plenty of opportunity. And when you come upon those scars, you got to be, again, honest and willing to understand and tell the story and then find the solution. I think about in the United States, for decades, we redlined communities. That means we built homes in a certain way, keeping folks that looked a certain way out of communities and putting folks that looked a certain way into others. And today, those red line communities, they're literally hotter because there's more pavement and there's less tree cover. So when we go about reweaving the fabric of our economy, it's not just an opportunity to tackle climate change. It's an opportunity to tackle the fundamental inequalities that we've created in our society. That's true for us domestically. It's true all around 
the world, and it's part of the responsibility of countries like the United States to help develop the world in a way that's overcoming those fundamental challenges. That's absolutely critical. It's absolutely critical. So look, um, you've heard all the wisdom here. Uh, and I think the takeaway is not just to be wiser, but to be moved to action. And I'll speak now just mostly to the students. Um, the first is to be skeptical and stubborn. <laughs> Uh, you know, whether it's, I, I know greenwashing got an applause line. <laughs> I know why. Um, we've got to, we have not enough time on the clock uh, to settle for anyone's word. Uh, that's where the data and transparency comes in. That's where the disclosure comes in. That's where regulatory action and setting hard standards comes in. And we got to do that not just in the power sector, but in every sector of our economy, and that includes the financial sector, because it's not that we don't trust you, it's that we're out of time. And we've got to have the transparency to know we're making the progress we absolutely need to make to meet this existential crisis. Here's the second thing. Be scientists. And I say this as a lawyer. <laughs> The scientific method tells us that we should be looking around, that we should be collecting data, that we should be observing that, analyzing it. And perhaps most importantly, and I learned this from one of my first bosses in government, Steve Chu, we should not be afraid of experiment. And here's what experiment is all about. It's about failing, failing quickly, trying again, perfecting the solution. And you don't you know what you call a scientist who's won the Nobel Prize but screwed up a bunch of times in the lab? You call them a Nobel Prize winner. You don't point them out and, and bench them because they failed. So be hard on your leaders, whether they're in government or in their public sector or in universities, be hard on them, be stubborn, be skeptical, but push them to keep trying, keep experimenting, keep finding the solutions that will work not only to advance, again, the cause of driving down emissions, but also to advance the cause of justice, to also advance the cause of empowering our workers and our communities. And that's the last, the last thing I'll suggest. You know, we, we take in the code red from humanity, from, from the IPCC. And it's, it's actually quite remarkable. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to really be involved in the entire uh, primary process, the sort of ideas primary that led up to the historic election of Joe Biden. And really right at the beginning of it, it was buttressed by the 2018 IPCC report. And from then, we sort of knew that whatever had been done before, every prologue was not going to be enough in terms of the level of ambition we needed to seek. And so for the first time in the United States of America with 81 million votes, more than anyone had ever gotten, someone ran on an ambitious plan to tackle the climate crisis and won and came in with a mandate. But now we're here with the latest IPCC report and there's a code red for humanity. And for a lot of folks, red is the color you identify with a stop sign. It stops us in our tracks how devastating the reality is. And I hope that in all of this incredible craziness that we've unlocked for ourselves since we were at 350 parts per million the day I was born, that we actually see a green light, a green light for action, a green light to reweave our economy in a way that's more just and more sustainable, in a way that empowers more women coming into positions of leadership, in a way that brings up the global south, it brings up our communities that have been left out and left behind. This is our moment, not just to tackle the climate crisis, but to make our society better. And what a better place 
to do that than in the academy, to center around this crisis that we face and give students the tools to take this on. Be stubborn, be skeptical, be scientists, but be optimistic. See the green light that's in front of us and chase after it. Thank you. Ali, um, thanks. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inspiring us. And also thank you for challenging us uh, for what we all need to do. Students need to do sitting in New York or here in this room and what we need to do as educators or whatever role we're playing. As I said at the outset, uh, Columbia is making a historic commitment to tackling the climate crisis through the creation of this school. Uh, the scale of the ambition is exceeded only by the urgency and scale of the challenge. Uh, and one of the things that is really important is how to think about partnerships. And so that's true for everyone in this room. We want to work with you and, and in innovative ways and think about how to do that. I look forward to having the chance to talk about that over drinks in just a few minutes. Uh, but I want to thank Alex and the climate school students who are in New York. I want to thank our live audience, many people who are watching uh, on the live webcast, our virtual audience around the world. Special thanks to Raj Joshi and the team at Bridging Ventures and to the University of Strathclyde for hosting us. Thank you uh, while we're here in uh, Glasgow for helping to put this event on. The full video recording of this event will be on the Columbia Climate Schools website in a few days. Uh, we hope you enjoy drinks and please join me again in thanking this extraordinary panel and Ali Zaidi.